Let's get started. Um, good morning. My name is Chuki. I'm going to tell you about Android custom components. Uh, first thing first, has you guys actually do you actually know what is a custom component? Have anyone has written one before? Okay, that's 15-ish people. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, so what we are going to go through today is well, first of all, understand why we want to do this, what this is, and what you can do with it. So first, let's just go through what are components. So here are a list of built-in components if you have used, I mean, even if you have only written Hello World, you would have used at least the text view. Essentially, these are just things on screen that you display things with. I guess that's too generic, but um, that's what a view is. It, it allows you to show different components like text, or images, and then more complicated things like the spinner. Essentially, it's a drop-down menu. I don't know why Android called a spinner. And then, yeah. And then there are more complicated things like the date picker, where there are buttons that you can press, and then things change. You can also type in. That in Android is also one single view. Well, it's a compound view, but we'll get to that. And then, if Android provides you with all these lovely built-in components already, why bother writing custom ones? Well, one very important thing, you just want to encapsulate what you do all the time into one single class, and then you can reuse it. So you can modularize your code. And there are some times where you want to just get to the gut of the system, and you want to override some protected methods. But beyond that, custom view is actually very powerful. If you have a really complicated, say, linear layout that has 10 different subcomponents in it, you may actually gain a lot of rendering speed if you just draw the thing, things yourself instead of ask Android every single time if you have a list view. Each of the list items is 10 views to draw it. If you can optimize it and have a one single view and you control where you put that image and that little checkbox and whatnot, you can increase your rendering speed by a lot. And finally, sometimes this is the only way. You couldn't do anything else. The, the standard components do not fit the bill. So here's how I categorize um, custom components. So simple view, meaning that this is just one single, essentially a canvas that gets rendered. So, so our favorite things like text view and image view will fall under that bucket. And then a container, I picked the word container because it's a layout, it's a view group. I couldn't figure out what to call it, so I picked a third name for it. Um, if you have used any of these things, you know already what is a, a view group. A linear layout, relative layout, frame layout, they are all essentially something that contains other views in it. And what, why are they called layout is because it determines where it goes on the screen, right? When you go and make a linear layout, you just essentially tell the system, I have four things, lay them out horizontally. But then there are other things like an adapter view, which is a little bit more complicated. It's still a container, essentially, because it has multiple things in it. But this view has this very complicated uh, algorithm to decide which views to show and then to um, recycle some views so that we don't blow up in terms of memory. And compound control, when you think of the day picker, you know, the widget that you press and then something show up and says year, month, date, it's actually just a composition of multiple things, right? You have three edit tabs and then you have six buttons, I guess, right? Because for, for each field, you can do plus and minus. And there are other kinds of uh, compound control, but I think the day pick is the most visual one. You can actually think, oh, right, you know, there are actually nine different uh, subcomponents there. And uh, we're going to start with something relatively simple. Uh, we're going to go ahead and override text view and add ad uh, additional functionality. All the code that I'm showing is on GitHub. So for example, this one is on that URL. And uh, you can go ahead and compile that later. Um, the last slide is going to have the point of this whole deck so that you can go quickly pick it and you don't have to write it down right now. But feel free to take notes if you have done or anything. <coughs> right. So uh, what we are trying to do here is take this snippet of code. Can you tell me what this snippet of code is trying to do? Anyone? Today's date. Today's date? Good. You get a cookie. <laughs> Ooh. See, answer questions. I want anticipation. <laughs> All right. So yeah, what it does is say you have this. Oh, this mouse too good. I need to close the lid. Get distracted. Um, 
you get this layout, and then you have this text field inside that is, has the ID date. And then we go ahead and grab it, and find out today's date and set text. Fairly straightforward. You probably have done something similar, right? Go ahead and get the layout and do something with it. And voila, that's what it looks like. And what we are trying to do now is in, instead of doing that, we're going to define this new view called a date view. Um, this is just your classic cookie cutter recipe for making a, a custom view. You extend view or any of its children, and then you can define its constructor. So there are three constructors right here. Uh, one takes just the context, and then takes, the other one takes context and set of attributes. And then we have the third one, we also have an additional style. The first constructor is used when you are declaring it in code. So if you have done something like text view, TV equals te new text view, parentheses, this, meaning the activity, this is a constructor that goes through. The second one is used when you are using your view in an XML file. So the uh, attribute set is all the things that's like Android, colon, color equal blah, all those attributes go through that attribute set. And finally, the last set has an additional style. Actually, it's what the theme goes through. I don't know why theme style are a little bit confusing, but if you, if you have a, if you're applying a theme or a style to your view, this is where you know which one is applied. So you don't actually have to define all three of them. If you have a custom view and you know that you're only going to use it in code, you can just do the first one. But then it will blow up if you try to use it in any other way. So I usually just stick the all, all three in um, just to be safe. So what happens now is that I'm going to have a helper function that will set the date. And this is what this is. It's not very complicated, right? We've seen it in the other slide already. We are just extracting that information and put it in this uh, helper function. And notice that I called set text here, which in the previous slide I said uh, text with dot set text. I don't have to say anything like that because this class is extending text view, so self, this, or whatever you call it, is, set, is already a text view. And now, how do we use it? So most of the time when we do a set content view, we actually uh, extract it from a layout and then call it. But what you can do is actually just take the, the, your view as the root and then set it. Um, and another way to go about doing this is to use it. Oh, I didn't update my slide. Well, um, I'm going to update it. So if you go to the code, it's actually I updated the name of the uh, of the class. But essentially, if you declare this class um, in, for example, this very long name, this fully quantified name, so basically you're sticking this date view .java file into that location on the source, and then uh, Android go ahead and compile it, and then when it expands the XML, it will know where to find that, and then call the co constructor that you declared with this attribute set. Right now, the attribute is weight and height. And then if you look at the activity, it's pretty standard, right? You just get the layout file and set it. But the beauty of this, going through XML and stuff code, is that all these attributes just work. Because we are standing text view, all the logic that go ahead and determine how to display it, what color, what size, will just work. You don't actually have to do a thing. It, essentially, you are just adding this extra functionality you did. So in our case, just displaying today's state. Any questions so far? Okay. Next, we are going to try to write a compound control. So remember, compound control is what I call the class of things like a date um, picker. It's essentially you're just grouping uh, existing things together and then add some extra functionality. So instead of a date picker, we are going to go ahead and implement a length picker. I come from Hong Kong, I use metric. I'm very confused about the fact that there are 12 inches in a feed. So I went ahead and made this class which will do the conversion for me. <laughs> it's just like the date picker, when you press, press plus, it increments. But then when you, it crosses the boundary, so instead of saying 12 inches, it says one feet. Uh, this is what we use to render the uh, date picker. Fairly straightforward. Um, Ignore the merge thing for now. So this is actually a linear layout. 
I am going to have a linear layout that's just on the things horizontally. I have a minus button, the text to display what is the length, and then I'll have a plus button. And to use this layout, I have just like a set date helper function, I have this init function, which will go ahead and inflate this layout. Now, um, in the previous slide, that's, I'm using merge instead of a linear layout as the root, because what is going to happen is that link picker, the, the parent class of it is going to be a linear layout. So if I, I'm going to have a linear layout, and I have this, this parameter, as the root when I inflate, and I stick an other linear layer inside, we'll have an extra nesting that's not necessary. So I'm just going to ask the system to go ahead and merge it up to the parent. And then the rest of the code is actually fairly standard. You can almost imagine that this is just in your own create function, right? I go ahead and find the idea of the different things that I'm going to use. Um, I'm going to set them on click uh, listeners, and then there's this function called update controls. This is where I draw the conversion. Okay, so I have this uh, parameter called num inches that is a mem member variable that go ahead and keep track of how many times you press the plus button and minus, how many inches you want to display, and then there's this little formula to compute how many feet and inches that is equivalent to. So once I computed that tag, essentially you know whether I want to do the um, five feet, three inches, or just two inches, I'm going to call it set tags, and then also, I'm going to have this extra thing where if you are already at zero for the minus button, I'm not actually going to let you go negative. Just something extra. I mean, you can probably write something that makes sense of negative inches, but for my case, I say no, you cannot do negative inches. Now, on click. This is the function that I'm going to use to make the buttons work. So this is how I usually do things. I have one uh, on click listener for multiple views. You may want to have uh, member variables that is a on-click listener. So that just looks more verbose to me. In any case, so the uh, on-click function, when it's called, is going to check which button get clicked, increment or decrement uh, the number of inches that's keeping track of, and then go ahead and call update control so that we show how many inches there is. And one extra thing that I'm going to add to this class is I'll have a getter function that just programmatically let me know how many number of inches there is, instead of just visually show the user so that other parts of the layout can make use of this data. One extra thing that I want to introduce is uh, saving state. How many of you have actually done that, like written a activity <coughs> and then override using the bundle so that when you do the orientation change, you will keep the data? Okay, that's great. So what we are doing here is essentially asking the view itself to keep track of its state. Uh, it looks a little bit scary, but the idea is the same. So there are this pair of functions where um, you can save the instance state into a bundle, and then you can restore it. So in our case, we just have one single integer that is the num inches that we uh, save and restore. So this is actually a function inside the view itself. So that's why on the on restore instance, it calls update controls. So it will Whenever we get a notation, it already knows that, ooh, I have to repaint myself to show the actual number of inches because nobody can actually see the m num inches, right? You actually have to update the view itself. So with all that, we have this lovely component that we can reuse. So uh, this is a little program that I wrote to compute the area when you gave it um, <coughs> two lengths in feet and inches. So you can just go ahead and press plus and minus, it will display to you in, in the human readable format, I guess. So instead of telling you it's 16 inches, it will tell you it's 12, no, 1 foot 4 inches, and then you know, the height is 2 inches, and you multiply them. Um, this shouldn't be too surprising. Um, essentially, in the uh, main .xml of your function, you can just say, well, I want to use a length picker twice. One of them gets the idea of width, one of them gets the idea of height, and then, you know, mix in some um, normal components that we are all familiar with, the text view, the buttons. And then, in the activity itself, I'm going to go ahead and grab them. This is essentially what we have been doing so far, except that we are using the length picker component that we just wrote instead of all the built-in components. And uh, I have this function called update area, which I am using it on resume 
so that when you get a rotation change and whatnot, the uh, computed area will also be updated, right? Because we already covered the case for the width and the height itself to be updated within the view, but the area is computed from the two uh, separate variables. And you look at the update area function, all it's doing is just asking the width, which is a length picker, and the height to get its uh, respective number of inches and multiply them together and go ahead and set that in the um, M area, which is a text view. So that is two, I would call lightweight custom view, because essentially what you're doing is just bundling what you can already do within an activity, say, and push it down to a view so that you can reuse it. So now we are going to get to more substantial, the powerful parts of a customized uh, component. There are three things you can do. So one thing is you can override the on layout function. This is mostly applicable to view groups. You are positioning your views within that view group container. Another thing is you can do is you can override the on measure function, which will let you change the size of the uh, of your view. And then finally, you can actually go ahead and paint the pixels. I was doing on draw slash display draw. So for a simple view, you usually call on draw, and for the layout, sometimes you want to call display draw, which Essentially, what it does is dispatch draw is the function that call the draw function on the children. So you may want to say if you have a list view, you may want to paint the background first and then stick in the individual items. <coughs> it will become clearer once we see the uh, actual code. But let me just cover the basic layout procedure uh, of how Android actually deals with the views. So whenever one of the children view got changed. So for example, you call set text on the text view. So some repainting needs to happen. Um, well, if you naively think about it, maybe you would just think that, oh, what's the big deal, right? Like the text will just repaint itself, done. But let's think of it this way, right? You have a text view that has the uh, wrap content uh, as its width, right? And then you change its length from May to November. So suddenly it's sticking out, right? You're just sticking the original width. So what it actually needs to do is actually needs to go ahead and recompute the whole screen to make sure that if anything to expand or contract is happening. So what it does is the view itself will call request layout, which it keep calling up the chain. So if you if you think of your XML file, for example, right, it, it has a hierarchy, right? So it has a linear layout containing maybe like an other set of things. It has two children in it. So it's just all the way call call all the way up to the view root. And then viewer will call back down and measure everybody to see how big they are, and then relay out them essentially if, if, if we need to jigger things around because people grow and shrink or anything of that kind. And like I said earlier, so when you are customizing a simple view, meaning that there are no multiple things in it, you can do either figure out how big it is by the on measure function, you can override that and do your own measurement, or you can override the on-draw function to paint the pixels yourself. <coughs> now, on-measure, what is this? So this is the function signature of on-measure. It takes two uh, parameters called width measure spec and height measure spec. It sounds very mysterious. What it is is actually just a 32-bit uh, integer, which has the initial bit, uh, two bits to be the mode. Let me see if I say. Oh, okay, I don't have it in the next slide. So if, if you go on to the online documentation, it explains. So there are different kinds of mode, and then the rest of the uh, integer give you extra parameters. So one of the modes is called exactly. So you're telling the viewer, I want you to measure yourself to be exactly 400 pixels. So the rest of the integer is just encoding the uh, 400 parameter. So once it like takes the uh, measure of spec, and then it will go ahead and do its measurement, and the way it converts, uh, convey the results back to the system is it's called set measure dimension, so that it sets some fields internally, so that later the layout manager and whatnot can come and grab it. Yes, question? Uh, just a quick clarification. You said pixels. Does it take pixels? Or, or does yes, it, it takes pixels. Not the deep? Not the deep. At, at this level, everything operates on pixels. You can come up to that talk later. <laughs> continue. Right, so the modes. So there are three kind of modes. One is so the parent come ahead, go ahead and say, unspecified, that 
be as big as you want. I don't care. No constraints. You know, the sky is the limit. Usually, what happens is that uh, it will be called at most acceptance. At most means that so maybe you have a table layout or something of that kind, right? Like it, it already know how big the, its children needs to be. It's like, yo, be 400 <coughs> pixels and call it a day. Oh, oh sorry, that's exactly. This is 830. I'm still sleepy. So exactly is when the parent go ahead and tell the child, like, you are going to be this big. At most means that, well, I have this much space, and take as much as you want, but, I'm a, but this is the maximum go. And I'm going to go ahead and show you this view that I wrote for my app, Monkey Write. I don't know if any of you read my bio. So I have this app that teaches Chinese writing. And there is this view that shows the character. What I want my view to do is I want it to stay a square at all times. I don't want to deal with, like, I always have to specify that it's 100 pixels width and height. Maybe I want it to be filling the width and then, you know, be the same on the width and the height. So I have. Uh, the over, I have a custom view that I override the on measure function. And look at this. The first line is actually just super dot on measure. I didn't actually go ahead and pick out all the all the complicated logic that I had to do. Like, oh, you want me to be exactly 300 pixels? Okay, I'll return 300. I'm just saying, hey, you know what? I'm extending view. View knows how to measure itself. I will just go ahead and take advantage of that. But after the measurement has happened, I'll grab the measured width and height, find out which one is smaller, turn right around and call set measure dimension on the smaller size. So essentially, this is the visualization, right? So maybe the system is giving me the rectangle on the left. And then on the on measure function, I'm just like, all right, so I have this area to work with. I'm just going to push it down and make it into a square. Three lines of code, I'm making squares. Yes? Where are you specifying exactly? And oh, this is actually translated from the system. So in the uh, when you specify, for example, Android colon layout with equals 300 pixels, essentially the um, Android system is translating that into, when it calls the measure function, it translates that into an exact, it's a, well, a width <coughs> measure spec of exactly 300. So if you're doing like a wrap, uh, wrap content, for example, it would get translated into an unspecified. Can you do that here? Um, you, you mean? When you set measure dimension. No, set measure dimension takes, um, it takes pixels. It's the, basically, you are, the specs are the requirements, right? You, you are, it's confusing because it's not an integer, but if you can think of it, it's almost like a class, right? You can, you can have a class that has two fields in it. One is the mode and one is the dimension. Right, so you're translating that compound specification into a single integer that is the actual pixel. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Come up for cookies later. All right, on draw. On draw is literally what you think it is. It draws stuff. Um, you can you know, you're given a canvas, and then you can draw lines, rectangle, circle, and all kinds of stuff to it. Path is just a set of x, y coordinates that you can keep going. And then if you um, choose to paint properly, it will either be like a line or something that's filled. Canvas. Canvas is something that you draw on. So if you think of, I guess, this as the canvas. I should have brought a canvas. Um, is you are drawing a line or circle on it. But you can also do things to the surface that you're drawing on. So you can translate it. So you can shift the canvas over and then draw on it. Or you can rotate it. Um, scale, skew, all kinds of stuff. And the interesting thing here is they also have something called save and restore. Um, I'm going to show you an example. So what happened is that maybe you're rotating something so that you can draw a heart that is 45 degrees, but then later you want to actually write on the, the canvas. You don't want that to be like this. But instead of calling, oh, we'll rotate back, you can just save and then just restore back to the stage where you started with. So you don't have to do the reverse um, operations is it's just mentally easier because right? you're just like okay I'm done with making stuff on the canvas that I have uh, twisted and um, skewed this way go back to the normal canvas and I'll continue my operations Question. yes does it save the state of the canvas when you first enter the end of the function then or good question yeah. I where does it get this, you know, this one wants to save? well actually um, it gets passed down the chain so there's actually one of the uh, examples that I used is the 
layout view, layout, um, sorry, the layout minimum view group is going to actually change the canvas and then call down. And so all the subsequent draws are on the rotated um, canvas. So it, it takes the stage from whatever uh, happens from the call chain. So if you think of it, right, like the way you want to draw a screen is you take the view route, right, and then you go ahead and, oh, I have a linear layout, draw this. And then the layout's like, well, how do I draw this? Well, I'll go ahead and tell all the children to draw itself. So the same canvas got passed down through the chain, <coughs> and whatever operation that uh, has been done will keep going. So wherever you are then, that's when it enters that function, you call save then, it's that's the snapshot. Exactly. And then it gets monkeyed with all the way down. And yeah. So we're going to draw a pizza. Let's just pause uh, on it and think about how would you go ahead and do something like that, right? So we have a circle, and then we have these, what I call cut lines. You're cutting the pizza into wedges. So this one has five of them. Anyone want a cookie? How would you, how would you draw this? Come on, it's not that difficult. Yes? Uh, circle, find the center, and draw five lines out. Okay, and how you, are you going to determine the xy coordinate of the lines? Like, are you, what's the math involved in that? Oh. Continue to listen. Somebody <laughs> else want a cookie? Yeah. Yeah. Rotate the canvas and just draw it horizontally. Right? Exactly. Uh -huh. my, my emphasis on the canvas the manipulation is paying off. Yes. So one answer will be you compute, right, with sine and cosine and all this different complicated, not that complicated, but more <laughs> sophisticated math. So that, um, so for example, I have the, the center of the uh, pizza, and then I will say, okay, I'll compute the xy coordinate and ask it to draw from this xy to this xy. But alternatively, you can do is that well, I'm always going to be drawing from essentially um, w over two, uh, h over two, if that's the width the height of your pizza, from that to zero and uh, no, sorry w over 2 and 0. Right? You can just keep doing the same operation, but just rotate the pizza, which is how I cut pizza. I don't know about you, but I just rotate and cut. Yeah? Could you just take the whole diameter, divide by 5, and then do an iterate over the pile? Take the whole <coughs> diameter and divide? The, the, the circumference. I'm sorry, circumference. Yeah, the okay. circumference. Well, yeah. You can just divide it, and then every 1, 2, 3, 4. Just iterate it, divide it by 4. Uh, well, first of all, there are five cut points. Five. Um, but well, you start out the yeah. Then yeah, that may work. I'm not sure. Basically, what you need is, at the end of the day is an xy coordinate, right? If you are not rotating your canvas, you need to compute exactly where this point is on this particular rotation orientation of the canvas. One quick question. Yeah. Um, is the canvas height and length, uh, or, or the length and width the same as the diameter? Um, it depends on what of the uh, layout width and height permission you gave it, right? If you gave it fill parent or match parent, then it was just going to take the whole screen. If you give it 100 pixels, take 100 pixels. Um, the way I've written this, I did not override the on measure function. So if you give it wrap content, I believe it's going to become 100 pixels because that's the uh, default width and height of the view. I'm not 100% sure on that. You may need to. But you know, usually we don't recommend going for default behavior, right? Like you want to make sure that if uh, you're going to share with the rest of your team and they will be able to use it without specifying with the height, go ahead and do it, override the or measure function, and then say that you want it to be a specific width or height if nothing is specified. But yeah, it just depends on what, how you're using it. Okay, drawing pieces. The first thing is uh, we are going to define a paint. Um, I think I talked about it a little bit earlier. You can choose different kinds of paint. So one style is stroke, meaning it's just the path itself. The other style is fill. So if I'm drawing a circle and I call stroke, then that's what you saw, right? It's just a piece of, it's just a ring essentially. But then if I call fill, then the whole thing is just filled up. And there are other parameters. I can set the width of the stroke. I can set the color and things of that kind. Uh, anti alias just means make it not jagged. I don't even know why you want to have jagged lines, but I always use anti alias. I don't know why the system will let you do things that are not anti alias. 
So this is how we define, essentially if you think of it, you have a, a, a pen, so to speak, right? that you're doing the drawing, so that's the paint. And then on the on draw function, I need to figure out how big my circle is. So this is just all the math that computes that. Um, the get width and get height, essentially, because I didn't override the uh, on measure function, the system knows how big it should be. It's just doing a standard measurement. Um, but one thing that to pay attention to is I also need to respect the padding. Um, I don't know if I, yeah, I don't think I have a uh, diagram for the padding. So essentially, if you have <coughs> looked into padding versus margin, padding is included inside your width and margin is outside. So if, if the user specified that, okay, I want a padding left of this much and right of this much, you actually need to subtract it out of your width when you're drawing your um, whatever view that you're drawing. So same goes for the height with the padding top and bottom. And then essentially this is just, I'm just uh, doing math to compute how big the pizza should be, where's the center. And then I have these two helper functions that draw the uh, pizza itself. So the first line, draw circle, I'm just calling it directly on the canvas. At the center that I just computed on the uh, radius, which I called it diameter earlier, but you know, just divided by two. Um, I'll fix the slide um, afterwards so that this is a little bit more consistent. And using the paints that we defined earlier, so that yellow thing. And then have a helper function called draw pizza cuts, which, like you guys suggested, all I'm doing is rotating the canvas, right? So I compute how many wedges there are. I mean, compute, compute the degrees from the number of wedges that I have defined, right? So if I have 10 wedges, then each time I need to rotate by 36 degrees. And then I just have a for loop. So okay, rotate my pizza, cut, which is just draw a line from the center to the to the edge, and then uh, repeat until I'm done. Not very complicated. And how do we actually use this class? By now, you should be pretty familiar and comfortable with seeing fully quantified components like that. Again, essentially, you just go ahead and grab. Uh, go into that directory in your source folder and grab pizza.java uh, and do whatever that we just defined, right? Like do the constructor, go through and um, do the on draw. And there's all these extra parameters I'm, I'm putting in just to show you what is the difference between the uh, padding and the margin. So this, if you can. So I'm, I'm adding this ugly gray background because otherwise you can't really see what's happening. So the gray background indicates the actual view, well, what we are drawing. Right? <coughs> so in the first case, there's a padding. So the pizza is smaller and there's room around. In the second case, the pizza extends all the way up to the edge, but then there's margin because um, the system, the layout, but the, because both of them live in a linear layout, the linear layout knows to interpret that margin and then push it over, but we don't have to do anything because that's taken care of by the by the layout. So but in the first case, the margin we have to know, right? Because we are given this square essentially, and we need to know that we need to restrict ourselves to a smaller um, painting right, area. Right, because if you didn't put the padding in your calculations, they both look the same. They will, yeah, they, they will look the same inside and just shift it essentially. So, yeah, that is a much better way to summarize what I'm trying to show. Yeah, this is showing the the padding uh, computation. Okay, so that is a view. Now we're going to get into this. Yes? Uh, what you were just doing, we normally do those with layer drawable. Is there a reason you wouldn't do a layer drawable instead? Layer drawable? Mm, can you explain what you mean by layer drawable? Yeah, I, I actually never used a layer drawable. How do you use it? And it just overlays images. Okay, so. You, know, how, you take one image, then you overlay, overlay, overlay. Okay, overlay. but the pizza is not an image. No, I'm saying you, just, you would just take an image of the whole pizza and you, then you would overlay a line. Each of the lines intersect. Each of the five lines. Okay, so how, where are you defining the lines? You calculate them the same way you calculate it here. Hmm. I am failing to understand. So I'm, I'm, I'm picturing a layer drawable as something that just takes some PNG files and put them on top of each other. Exactly. Right. So you still need to define the PNG file. So here, there is no PNG, right? Like all the lines, all the pixels and whatnot are programmatically <coughs> computed. You are just literally painting the screen. So that would be the difference. Okay. Right, so back to view group. A view group, like I said, is a container, it's a layout, it contains children. This is the center of 
what a view group is for. It's for its children. I guess you can call it a parent or something. So the on measure function is measuring how big it is, itself is, but how does it determine how big it is? It has to go and ask all its children well, how, how, how much space you want to take. So an on layout is where do they go? And the dispatch draw is the function that gets called to draw all the children, and you can get a chance to do stuff before the drawing happens. And I am going to show you this view, this uh, view group, sorry, that will take four photographs and just lay them out so that it lined up in a spiral. If you want to do this without having a custom layout, it's pretty difficult. I'm not even sure how you would do that. Um, I guess you could play tricks with a relative layout and you can place them um, and make sure that they are all, you know. If you want to do say in a relative layout, right? So the first one just top left, so you just smack them down. And then the second one, you can say, oh, I want it to be on the left of the first image. But what you can do instead, now that we have this hobby, heavy arsenal called the uh, custom view, you can go ahead and just <coughs> have a layout manager with the, the view group that will compute the XY coordinate of each photo and just stick it there. So since we are writing our own view, if you're not publishing it to anybody, just yourself, you can make assumptions and take shortcuts. So in, in my case, I assume that there are going to be four photographs that are in the same dimensions and they will be given to me in the landscape portrait, landscape portrait order. This is just being lazy, right? Because I'm actually going to go ahead and measure the first photo, assuming that there's a first photo. Um, you may want to be more robust if you're going to share with your team, but um, you know, as an independent developer, sometimes you take shortcuts, and it's perfectly fine because when it, it, it when it uh, you know you'll, you'll test your code before you you uh, shift, right? So if you accidentally paste in uh, one few photo, and it will just crash on you. All right, so I am going to <coughs> measure how big this whole view group is going to be, and if you think about it. Essentially, it's a square, right? So if, if you have a photo that takes the width of the photo when it's uh, horizontal, and then the width of the photo when it's, um, well, I guess portrait and landscape is less confusing. So I'm going to take the first photo and then measure its width and just add them together to determine the size as, um, of the uh, view group. And this is the interesting part that the view group dot resolve size is a system function that will take the views uh, the width span things like exactly undetermined and whatnot and the maximum size you desired which was the one that we just computed by knowing the size of the child and it will tell you uh, what is the final width so it will take into account if it's something that for example if you think of the uh, the perimeter in terms that you're familiar with like the uh, field parent, right? So if my view say, well, I need to be 500 pixels wide, and the system say, well, actually, you know, <coughs> I have 1,000 for you, and if you go ahead and put that into resource size, it will pop up 1,000 because that is, um, because essentially the field parent perimeter is <coughs> from, um, from the XML. Does the resolve size, size include uh, uh, Padding and margin uh, calculations, or? Uh, does that? I think so. Not. I have not looked at the source code, so I am not going to commit to my answer. But I think so. <coughs> yeah. And then this is where all the fancy schmancy layout happens. I mean, the math is also a little bit clumsy, uh, but the idea is that you are just getting where uh, the x y coordinate should be. Um, I'm not going to actually go through the, uh, the math, but the, if you think of it like right, you have this view group that you want to place your child in, so you're just going to put bam, 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 just put it in, compute the x, y coordinate, and the, what you want to pay attention to is this line called child layout. So what you, when you override on layout, you must lay out all your children. You must call this function called child.layout and tell it where is um, essentially the top left, uh, top left, bottom right? I think that's the order. This is how you lay out something. You, you, you essentially fix the corners of, of your child, and you are, you must do this. Otherwise, uh, are it just X and just Y yours, or is that? 
you just have. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's next slide. Okay, good. Um, that's that's essentially just a map that I uh, I used to shift things around. There must be a, mo a much more clever way to do this, but uh, I was running out of time when I prepared my slides, so I just have this really clumsy way of oh, if it's the first photo, then you adjust it by this amount, and if it's the second photo, then you do that. Um, so yeah, essentially I'm just computing the x and y um, depending on which number you are in the uh, in the in the array. So that that was pretty heavy. I mean. Questions before I get into the next example. Okay, so uh, this is the final example actually. It's the uh, the spec draw function that I want to show you. Um, like I said earlier, what this function does is it paints all the children views. And I should have put a background. So what this is is there's this view view group here that shows. Um, Essentially, uh, three views that are sideways, three text views that are sideways, and then I just take this in to show you that it's not taking up the whole space. I actually measure this properly. So, what's going on under the hood? I am taking a linear layout, and I'm just rotating it. So, I think everybody knows how to make this happen, right? You just have a linear layout, you stick in three text views, set is, you know background and color and bold and whatnot. So this is very straightforward, but the, the, the interesting thing is, and then I'm just going to have a view that just says rotate whatever is inside. Instead of something heavy and duty, which is I will take a canvas and to go ahead and draw all the pixels myself. I will have a rectangle that's this size and then draw the text and whatnot. I mean, there's no, no need to reinvent the view. The system knows how to do a linear layout. Uh, so this is how that view looks like, right? So you can imagine that this, instead of a sideways layout, in the, it's a linear layout. It even has the word vertical in it. Um, and then you're just sticking things in as normal. And like I promised, it overrides a linear layout. OK, can someone tell me what's happening in the on measure function? What the hell am I doing here? Exactly. Again, I'm just being lazy, right? I'm not going to take the width spec and height spec and all the do those calculations. I'm just saying, yo, measure yourself, but I'm actually going to use the, the your results in a different way. Um, and then in here, I'm just going to go ahead and rotate the canvas and draw it. But you need to be careful, right? Um, if you just rotate your uh, <laughs> So rotation happens at 0, 0 if you don't say anything. It pivots around 0, 0. So if I just rotate it up, it will be off the screen. I actually made that mistake when I did not do the demo. I'm like, where did it go? And then I realized that I actually have to translate it down first. Um, yeah, you know. That, that's how we operate, right? Trial and error. It's like, it should work. Uh, uh, no, where did it go? So that took me a while to figure out that it got rotated up. So that's, that's the way the translation happened. I'm going to shift it down. I should be found by height. Again, um, because the uh, drawing happens after all the layout and measurement, I can just go ahead and got, call get height, and it knows how much to ship it down by. And I think, yeah, someone was asking me earlier about the canvas. So this is what happens, right? I am modifying the canvas, and then call super to with the modified canvas. So all the children, when they get the canvas to draw itself, it's actually it has no idea, right? It's just still doing it horizontally, uh, like a normal um, text view. But because the canvas is rotated, the final result is what we wanted. Ah, right, the answers are here. So that's what I was doing with the width and height. And then, again, I think I'm repeating myself a little bit. So on draw means draw myself, and despair draw means draw the children. And in our case, we just want to, before we draw something, go ahead and mark with the canvas so that it um, does the rotation first. So, with all, yes? When you do that, then you have the caveat of the, your XML layout isn't set height, it's not set height, it's set width. Set height is not set height? It's, yeah, because you rotated it. Ah, right, yeah, you have to use it, um, good point. So if you have, like, for example, have, a, like, a, a fill parent, on the on your uh, with and height, and then you're like, well, you know what? I'm going to stick a silence. Well, you're, sorry, your screen is not actually that big. So using using custom layout 
like, like I said, I actually take a lot of shortcuts in, in doing custom layouts because um, you're trying to solve a specific problem usually. Yeah? If you go back a couple slides to the picture. The picture. The screen, yeah. If there's something directly under or directly right of this, after you rotate, will that, will that stuff move? Is that, does that answer the question? Well, okay, I see that, but now if I, if I turn that, uh -huh. or where is that in the original? Before you rotate it, where is that welcome to my library? Um, actually, you don't think of it that way, because when uh, I said earlier how the layout works, remember, it does um, the measurement and then the layout. By the time the measurement happened, I'm already swapping the width and the height. So that in the eye of the system, this is just a rectangle that is this wide and this high. It has no idea that under the hood, it, you know, for a very, very short moment of time, it was, it was like this and then turned. Because by the time measurement, set measured dimension has occurred, the dimension is already this one, a skinny one. So in the eye of the system, it never knew that there existed a smaller, ver like a, a, a non-rotated version of it. So um, you can think of it as like this is just a view that was given this dimension from the beginning. Because right? the system doesn't know. Okay, okay jump ahead. So back to his question, where is the welcome in my library? Where is that text view? Um, text view or did you draw that on? I don't have it on a slide. But if you take this and then you wrap it in a bigger linear layout okay. that is horizontal, yeah, it, 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 not enough space. But right, so it's essentially you're just, just treating it as a linear layout, right? You're just using it as one view and then you can stick things inside and wrap things around. Yeah, and like I said, everything is on GitHub. Um, so if you go there, and you, you can see the actual main.xml and how everything gets put together. Okay, so now we are actually going to get to the reusable part. Um, the, the title of my talk is Reusable Android Components, so how do you actually reuse that? Um, so one thing you can do is just what we did in the lens picker, right? You're just calling the same component more than once in your own project. But another thing you can do is actually put it inside a library project. Um, what you do is you create a new Android project, and then you change it to tell that it's a library. And then you know things like pizza dot java uh, will go ahead and live in this project instead of your main project. And with that, you can actually define your own XML attributes. So earlier when we were doing the pizza, I have this constant <coughs> that says it has five wedges and is yellow. Well, I'm going to go ahead and define some of my own custom attributes so that I can vary the the number of wedges and the color so that I can have different kinds of pizza. Well, how do you do that? So in the library project, if you're going to go under that route, you are going to put a uh, atters.xml, which um, I don't know why it's called declare styleable. Um, that's one of those things that you have to ask the Android team why they come up with the name. But essentially all you're doing is de declaring the attributes. So I have three attributes. One is uh, the width, and then the other one is the number of wedges, and the third one is the color. Um, so interestingly, there's a format called color. If you have done it in Android, right, it, it knows how to translate a pound, you know, FFF into the value corresponding to, the, to that color. Um, and then, when you are in the pizza file itself, instead of having the hard-coded constants, you can retrieve the attributes from the attribute set. Rings a bell, right? The attribute set that earlier when I showed you the three uh, constructors, that's where you get that attribute set. And you can go to pull it. Um, so the interesting thing is that there's this thing called a namespace, which you're going to use in the XML file. And um, it used to be that you have to specify the namespace as the name of the actual package. So if you're using it as in a library and you're going to use it in multiple packages, you know, the first one will be called pizzeria, the second one will be called the batch party or whatever, then it's not going to work because you, you don't know where to get the namespace. But since uh, the, 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 this version of the uh, SDK, not the, what, the ADT, I don't know what it stands for, but essentially all the build tools, um, 
it knows to replace the auto one with the actual app package so that when the library get used in the app and compiled, it, it knows where to find all those attributes. And this is just, uh, I mean, just a quick explanation. It's trying to get an integer value, but if in your XML file you did not specify it, it will use the default one. So everything is clear, right? You, you, your class is self-defined. Well, it doesn't want to tell me what color the pizza is going to be. It's going to be yellow. And then when you are using your library in your app, um, I am very afraid of live demos, so I did not have the clip up. But if you imagine you have the clips up, and then you right-click on the project and choose the Android um, option, then in the bottom, there's this thing that is called libraries, and you can go ahead and add that from a, uh, another Eclipse project. And now, and like I said earlier, this is the line that we all blindly copy, right? This XML, NS, Android, blah, blah, blah. So it actually means something. So in our case, we need to specify. So this Android refers to this Android. So okay, what are these XML attributes? Where are they defined? So for us, we have this new set of parameters called PISA, and we are using it here. So like I said earlier, this auto thing, that's the magic so that it will link it properly when you compile your library project with your actual app. So if you have two different library projects included, both of them will have the, like, let's say you have pizza and you have, I don't know, like cola, right? Right, right. Um, so will the second namespace also be schemas or android.com slash apk slash res auto or? How? Yes. Yeah. Um, so when you think of it, actually, like the res auto is actually replaced literally by the system with com dot example dot pizza. It, it's actually just the name of the app package. So if you're using it in multiple, um, it will, it will have the same value. How does it know to import pizza and not your other library? Um, it's... Or would it just import both and stick them both other attributes underneath the pizza tag? I don't actually know the underlying way of how things get linked up and whatnot. Um, and to be honest, I have not tried to have two. Uh, I would love if someone do it and you know tweet me and tell me what happens. You may get more than a cookie if you want. <laughs> Two hey, cookies. Don't know if you guys are that dedicated to this, yes? I think the namespace has to be the package of the app you're running. Exactly. So that's how it gets exactly. So like I said, if you have two of them with from two different libraries, they and used so say you have a pizzeria uh, app that sells pizzas and breadsticks. Right, so uh, both of them, when you have XML dot, uh, XML and S colon pizza, or with auto, and XML uh, and pizza, but XML and S colon breadstick, if both of them will be replaced by the pizzeria app, uh, you know, dot, uh, column dot pizzeria uh, uh, package. Okay, and so now we have two pizzas with different parameters, different color, different amount of wedges. 15, it's out of my mind, that's kind of hard to cut. We'll see if I actually show it. Oh no, no, 15 is the width, okay, sorry. I thought I'm cutting the pizza into 15 pieces. No, 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 I was not out of my mind, it was only six wedges. Okay, good. But this is what happens. Um, we have a piece of real with two pieces in it. The first one is this red one that has a very skinny edge, and I cut it into four pieces. And I guess the second one is skip dish. It has a thick <laughs> edge. Um, and I want to slice it up more. And it's yellow. It has more cheese on it, whatever. But the, the idea is that all you need to do is read up. Uh, sorry. Robotan. Robotan. Uh, you're just reusing this class we defined, right? Uh, but then we have all these custom attributes, right? So because if you think of it, right, earlier when we have the hard-coded uh, attributes, you can have a pizzeria that only sells one kind of pizza. But now we are just reusing it, and then we, we are using this. We are by this point very familiar with all these attributes, right? So this is much more reusable than this single class that stays in the single project with hard code consonants. Consonants? Constants, sorry. Right, fragments. Um, this is kind of big, right? Like when fragments come out, that these things that you can reuse and you can make your phone code and your tablet code. Um, or share you know, substantial code, but what is exactly a fragment and how does that relate to all these custom views? So a fragment, if you think of it, is essentially just an activity, a sub-activity 
if you want to think of it that way. Go through the activity cycle, go through on create, go through all these uh, on resume and whatnot. And, the, uh, and they are aware of each other in, in the sense that you can go through the fragment manager and grab each other. But basically these are just two different things in your toolbox, right? You cannot use a fragment to draw a pizza. It just doesn't work. All the fragment does is it and encapsulate the logic to, for example, maybe you are going to uh, talk to the uh, GPS and then you do stuff, right? So all the initialization maybe it goes in, in the on resume uh, function of your fragment. But the, the fragment doesn't have capability to swap layouts and do different things. Like that. I don't want to throw it in there because it's a little bit confusing uh, when you are thinking of components that can be reused. So summary, we have covered a lot here. So um, I'm categorizing it into like, if you, if you remember um, earlier, I have this table of simple view, compound, control, and then the view group. Um, sorry to mess you with your mind, but I'm changing the way I'm customizing, I'm categorizing these things. Um, so there are things what I call a shortcut view. Essentially, you are just bundling what you are already doing in activity, push it down into a view and then do it. You're not doing any drawing, any measurement, or any, any, anything like that. You can almost say that you don't need a custom view for that in, in, the, in the sense that all the capability you wanted is available to you through the individual components. You are doing that for modularization, for reusability, for clarity of code. Um, and then custom view is a single view that you go ahead and measure and draw. And the view group is a layout, essentially. You have multiple things inside. Um, so we have a few examples. I'm just going to state them once more so that you, you understand different kinds of things you can do, right? So for example, the text view that we took to make our date view is, is just taking the today's date, sticking in like that functionality, and pushing it down to um, the, the view class itself. So it's a subclass that you are essentially using it like a text view, except there's this extra functionality that comes for free when you use your own view. And you can also do something like the length picker, where you are just bundling existing stuff together and then use it as a repeatable component. Custom view, if it's a simple view that you are redrawing or measuring. So the square view is something that I showed you earlier that you can change the width and height. Um, Pizza, we can draw pizzas. View group. Um, so on measure, you actually use a lot, but I, I almost think of it as uh, on measure and on layout, it's like a pair of functions that work together. But what makes view group powerful is the fact that you can put the children in different places. <coughs> so like the example I show you is a very nice spiral. You can also imagine something you call like a photo scatter or something, right? That you just have a, maybe you all go for a frame layout so that you're, you're already laying things on top of each other, but then just have a random X, Y, and rotation so that you can just um, give it a list of, say, 10 photos and we'll just put things on top of each other and lay them out randomly just for kicks, right? Um, so, but when you do that, you do need to know how big your children is so that you, you can place them in, properly in the, on the screen. So on layout and on um, measure work hand in hand, but in the case of a view group, the layout is the part that makes it interesting. And finally, this back draw is the function that calls the draw function on, on the children, and you can intercept it. Most, in most cases, you want to do it either before or after the drawing happened. I've not actually seen a case where you want to like, draw the first child and then do something and then draw the rest of the children, but it's up to you how to deal with it. So the example that I showed you was the sideway layout where you rotate the whole canvas and then draw the children. And that's all. Um, like I said, the slides are online, so that's the short link. If you uh, want to write that down, that will be very useful. It's actually, I think, included somewhere in the program website, but the website wants people to upload either a PDF or a, or a zip file. So we will download a zip file with a text file that has it's that link. A, yeah. So you may as well write that down right it's now. It's actually a Word document. Oh my God, it's a Word document that has the link. So do yourself a favor, just copy this down. Um, and the uh, second very mysterious link is actually a MailChimp mailing list. Um, I'm actually thinking about 
putting a bunch of blog posts uh, about what I talked about. Because right now it's just a uh, GitHub repository, and I think code speaks for itself, but I may want to put some English around it so that people understand what's going on. So if you're interested in getting that, or maybe I'll write an ebook, who knows? But I feel, I feel like there is not a lot of information about custom views right now on the internet. That's why I'm doing this now. So if you're interested uh, in you know, anything that I'll be doing in the future about Android development, um, be it like, you know, my next appearance in uh, conferences or um, more blog posts, you can go ahead and subscribe. And then the rest is just blog and Twitter. And finally, shameless plug. I have this app called Monkey Writes, and there is a custom view in it. The actual character writing uh, area is a custom view. If you guys would be so nice to download it and check it out and give me feedback, that would be great. And speaking of feedback, I have this list of things that I need to tell you guys. Please encourage attendees to provide feedback through the conference app. So please do. Um, actually, in fact, I'll modify that. Please provide feedback through the conference app if you like this talk. If you don't like it, just come up and tell me. <laughs> um, there's also a this little widget that I put in. I'm, I'm not sure if actually people use that site. This site called Speaker Rate, where you can go ahead and rate speakers and um, say, oh, she did a great job. It was funny and informative. Hey, a raw review for myself. Um, so if you, if you want to go through that route too, I will appreciate it so that next time I get you know, speaking engagements, they know other people love me too. Um, but beyond that, it's uh, question time. So this might be a little bit outside the scope of your talk, but um, besides these approaches to implementing custom components, can you speak a little bit about um, taking maybe private views that are inside the <coughs> Android source and pulling them out into your app to either customize them or make them available on older versions of the platform? Um, well, it depends on what exactly you're trying to do. You may be able to do a lot of this by just overriding protected functions like with, without actually copying the code out. So if you're already down the rabbit hole and you're looking at the source code, yeah. Um, yeah. try not to do it just because it's heavy, right, if you're copying code out. Um, right. And I have never even thought about doing that, to be honest. So, Would you recommend against it? or No, I yeah. mean, it's Apache 2, right? It's, it's yeah. there for you to mark with. Mm -hmm. If there is this component that you really want, you, and you can go ahead and do that. Um, like I said, it is, it's, uh, depends on the case, how the complexity of it. And just be aware that some of the Android code may be deeper in the system than what us developers normally have access to. So if some things may or may not work. Right, but, right. No, why, why not? Just. Um, Usually, what I the, the extent of <coughs> me using the source code is reading it, understanding under the under the hood what it's doing, but I have not actually go ahead and copy it out and then um, customize it. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks. When do you see runtime performance improvements by making custom views? Ah. So, so this is actually a classic example that Google provided. So I'm just going to parrot it. Um, when you look at your Gmail app, it has a title and like a little snippet of what the email is, and then a checkbox, and then a star. So that is at least four views, if not more. And everything sits inside a list view, right? So basically what happens is when they wrote the Gmail app, <coughs> the scrolling was slow because it's rendering all these different subcomponents as uh, standard Android views, right? Like basically there are like five, three text views, right? One for the title, one for the date, one for the snippet, and then one image view for the star and then one checkbox. And they <coughs> went ahead and just make a custom view that draws the things. Um, so so and in the eye of the list view, it's just one single view. It doesn't have to do all the measurements, um, the, the, the layout measurements. And, and that was a lot of, I mean, I don't know the numbers. They may or may not have published that. But that visually, at least when you scroll, it's, it's not jaggy anymore. Like the, the drawing copes much better when it's a custom view. Yes? So um, I've, I've seen a few articles on, on custom uh, views, and this is pretty much the content that, that, that ends up being talked about for the most part. Can you talk about like invalidation? So for example, if you have a view that like you're, you're dragging stuff in, like how do you invalidate the view and enforce a redraw, especially when you don't really need to remeasure because you know the you know the measurement of the control hasn't right. changed. It's just like you want you know we want to force redraw. Invalidate actually does not call measure. Okay. So I don't think you need to worry about that. And it, 
Um, so well, sometimes sometimes you might want to call invalidate. Like I, I don't, I'm not trying talking about the actual invalidate function. Oh. I'm, ju I'm just calling it invalidate because in most frameworks you kind of invalidate either the height or the the canvas, right? Like so. So in some some if you have like a slider where you're just sliding it, mm -hmm. you don't need to remeasure the control. Yes. If you have a button that expands the component, then you have to ask the parent to remeasure. Yes. So like, what? How do you do those things? A little bit hard to speak to it generally, right. but um, I'm just going to give like a little overview of what invalidate means so that people are not confused, right? So what happens is like in Android, what you can do is there's a function called invalidate that you can call on the view, and if you are not on the UI th thread, you, call, you need to call post invalidate so that it gets posted to uh, the um, Android, the, the main UI thread. And what it does is it essentially just uh, call draw so that the, the view will draw itself. And on, in the case what you're talking about when you want to make sure that essentially the, the view is fresh, right? Um, I'm just stalling. I don't have an answer. I think it's, I think it's the, I think it's the um, but if you want, like, you can tweet me and I'll, I'll find Yeah, we can definitely have the discussion. I just don't have an answer on stage. Sorry about that. Yeah. That's the hazards of being a speaker. You may not be able to answer all your audience questions. <laughs> yeah. Yes? When you decide you want to build a reusable UI, how do you decide whether or not that should be an activity, a fragment, or a custom control? Um, again, the answer is depends, right? So, for example, in the case of like what I showed you earlier, like the pizza, it doesn't make sense to be an activity, right? You're not going to have. So and you think, oh, maybe it's a fragment, right, instead of a, a uh, custom view. Um, so the, the fragment is interesting because you can, in my mind, abuse it, right? Because you can use the fragment pretty much exactly the same as a custom view. You can, because it's inflating an XML and then it's doing stuff. I think, um, for me, the differentiator between a fragment and a custom view is that the fragment goes through the activity cycle. So it, it actually has the on create and on resume. You you can do things depending on where what the activity is doing. Whereas in the view, it's not as relevant. The view itself is just painting pixels, um, depending on the internal state rather than the state of the activity itself. So that that would be for me the one criteria. And and then um, of course there are cases where you need to measure your view. Then the fragment is just not going to help. That's, that depends on what you need to do. And, and if, if you are just trying to reuse something, usually fragment is pretty good. That will be, yeah. I might have mentioned compatibility. You can't go too far back if you get it right. So you know, picking what platform you might fall upon, right? 2.2, .2, you ruled out. You can use the compatibility library. So, but unless you're supporting Cupcake. Uh, who supports Cupcake anyway? You? Yeah, you support, support cupcake or you have a question? Yeah. No, no, I still support cupcake. Wow, great. <laughs> he did the two cookies. Two cookies for that guy. Well, it depends on if I run out of Alright, so that's all. People who have earned cookies can come up and we can, we can test it. Um, you know,